Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Lorenzo's Music Podcast. On today's show, I am talking with a musician who I've actually met several times over the years. They have been in several bands at one time and had a solo career. And to this day, they are still in several bands at one time and have a solo career. The person has a new remix that just came out and has been releasing music for the past year or so consistently, about a single a month. So we get into the writing process, the recording process, the releasing music process, and learn more about the, this musician. So here's the interview starting right now. I'm Nicholas Burgess. Um, I'm a musician. I'm a rock musician, I guess you would say. Yeah. Uh, I've been doing um, the last couple of things I did were like kind of like spooky uh, Halloween type. Well, I've done some covers and stuff recently too, but I've been doing a mix of things, but I guess rock uh, kind of like weird. Um, uh, it's sometimes like new wavy type stuff. Yeah. And what are the covers you did? I'm not familiar with the covers or did I just not know um, they were covers? You might not have known they were covers. I did um, last year. I did a superstar. That was a uh, the Carpenters. Oh. Um, I did a Nirvana song last year. I did a Pearl Jam song. I just did um, Telephone. That was yeah. a cover. Yeah, that's a Lady Gaga song. It's oh, that's why I didn't it. know it. Okay, I'm not. I'm not as. <laughs> I'm familiar with Lady Gaga, just not the work. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's a cover, and it sounds totally different. So, even right. if you were familiar, it's quite different. Uh, and I got a bunch like in the um, coming up, but I don't know what's actually going to be coming out when. Yeah, and for people like listening, whole, well, for ahead. people listening, where are you located right now, too? Uh, oh. Just so we can get a hint I'm, of where you are in the world. I'm in Boston, Massachusetts, USA. Okay. And you've lived there your whole life? No, I, well, a lot. I've been in New England my whole life. I grew, I was born, and I grew up in in Maine, and but I've been here like my whole adult life. Okay, yeah. The I want to say, and hopefully I have this. I'm I'm gonna lump myself into this, uh, but mm -hmm. I may be wrong just because I'm here. But you have the same sort of pleasant affliction that I do, where you don't sound like you're from Boston. And I kind of oh. don't sound like I'm from Wisconsin. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I just, uh, even a lot of people from Boston don't have a, a Boston accent. Um, it's certain parts of the city and people who've been here a certain amount of time are like different suburbs. And, okay. Uh, you don't hear it as much as you would think you do. I mean, I when I've been to the Midwest, like you don't hear that accent everywhere. You hear it. Yeah, Some that's places. true. There, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're aware of what places there are where it's, it's more farther up north. It's it's very Wisconsin. Um, mm -hmm. We're kind of I'm in Madison, so we're kind of like Florida. Like you go down south, everybody talks yeah. southern, and then you hit Florida, and it's like, where did the southern accents go? Yeah, I haven't been to Madison. I've been to Milwaukee. Oh yeah, Milwaukee, um, Milwaukee's kind of the same. Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't super. Like you'd meet a few people who had an accent, but just kind of a standard american accent okay places boston's kind of the same way all right depending where you go who you talk to and now i've actually spoken with you many times over the years i met you first when you were in a band called hex map way mm -hmm. back and you actually are, you are still in that yeah we did a, a new ep a few years ago okay um We've been working on some stuff, but um, actually, Mike, who's in Hexnap with me, played on uh, that telephone recording. He played some guitar on it. And okay. I talk to him every day. So we have some stuff going. But yeah, we did a new EP. I think it was 2021 when it came out. Okay. So fresh out of the pandemic is what you're saying. Yeah. Well, we had an album. I can't, I can't remember the exact dates. I think the album came out about a year before. And then we followed that up with an EP and we don't have anything else coming up at the moment, but um, yeah, we do have some stuff in process. Okay. That's, 
And that was the thing too, is when I talked with you in Hexmap, you were also in like five other bands at the time. And it sounds like you're still being pretty active. Uh, yeah. And you were doing your solo stuff. Yeah, that's kind of, you know, that's how it is. Yeah, no, I, I think like the grind. With a lot of musicians, I, uh, I think, especially the longer it goes on, the more projects you end up being in. Everyone's kind of in five or six different things. Yeah. And when we started this conversation, you had actually been, you, you were explaining the type of music that you're doing. And with these other bands, would you say they're in the same genre or what would you, are they different? Um, like, are they appeasing different feelings that you like to express or? Well, um, Hex Map is more about like the collaboration and, um, uh, you know, uh, Mike and I both having an equal say in what we're doing. And we kind of go for, I don't know how to describe it. We go for more of a, a specific kind of, sound on that stuff but also without as many rules about like for instance in my solo stuff i might be more apt to say i don't want any songs to go over four minutes or three minutes i want to keep this all tight i want it to sound like this this and this whereas with hex map it might be like well, let's just let it go and see what happens uh you know it's more like an art rd band than than my own stuff rd or um, rd r-o-r-t a-r-t-y okay. <laughs> I thought maybe you were telling me a new genre that I hadn't heard about. <laughs> <laughs> and um, with our, our like, I, I've been recording music for my friend Brian Church. He has does a lot of solo stuff. He does a he has other bands too, and I've he plays bass on almost everything I do, and I record a lot of stuff for him. And with that stuff, he just brings it, plays it. I record, and then as I'm recording and I hear things, maybe I'll. I'll say, you know, maybe you should try this or maybe we should record it like that. But that's really like his songwriting. Um, yeah, it's it's all slightly different. The biggest difference with my solo stuff is that I'm only answering to myself really on the solo stuff. Well, of Where course, anything, else, anything else I do is about like the. Um, the relationship with whoever I'm working with. OK, and. Now, what would you say is your main instrument of choice? Because working with working for yourself, of course, you have to play everything. Well, I don't have to play everything. I don't play everything. But okay. what I do is, um, I uh, I guess, in some ways, my main instrument is guitar because that's what I'm most comfortable playing. But with a lot of my solo stuff, I end up, um, uh, I'll, I don't play keyboard very well, but I'll write out like MIDI parts um by hand uh not by hand but like on the keyboard i'll write out midi parts and by keyboard there i meant computer keyboard not like a right yeah a piano. um so i'll make those parts up and there's a lot of like synthesized things that i wrote um and on my demos i will play everything you know i might play bass or something but on the final recordings i'll bring in people to play other things either because you know i want their specific style or sound or just because i kind of want um a diversity of of uh different styles and voices just to make it sound less like it's all me mm -hmm. so like uh brian who i mentioned i have him play bass because he always comes up with stuff that's not quite what i would do and he plays slightly differently than i would play and even if it's a really simple part I think it's still worthwhile having him play it because um, I don't want everything to just sound like me. Mm -hmm. I think it adds a little bit of depth if it doesn't. And then like literally with voices, I might have people come in and do backup vocals or sing a different part just so it's not all my voice. And are these people that are around you locally or are they people um, online? Some of like, them how are. are you collaborating? Some of them are. Like Brian is, is local. I'll actually have him come over and we'll record stuff together and I'll record some of his stuff and he'll play bass or sing or whatever. Um, or Mike, who is uh, in the band with me, um, he's local. Although often when we work together now, it'll still be um, him mailing me a file, not ma like emailing me a file yeah. that I can put into, uh, put into the track. Because when we do get together, we're probably just going to be like, 
playing video games or going out to dinner or something. <laughs> right. But uh, then there are people who are just totally remote. Um, uh, there's a woman in uh, Mexico who I've never met in person, but she did um, a spoken word part on one of my songs for the last album. Um, and, you know, I'll meet them various ways online and uh, just work digitally on some stuff like that. Okay. And when you're, you were, you had explained some of the process with the way that you work with different people and with your own stuff. You even had expressed like, maybe I only want the songs to be this long. How much planning do you do beforehand or do you just kind of start out and then decide like what's your process with with concepts like that um it depends what i'm working on but if i um let's say like for this next album i'm doing i'm currently working on that'll probably be out later this year i kind of have a general idea of what kind of sound i want from the tracks mm -hmm. and uh, i'll start working on demos and i will record Fairly fleshed out demos that'll have, um, uh, you know, drums, guitar, um, keyboards, vocals. I'll just make sure like this, this song's gonna work, so I can hear it as a song. Um, and you're talking multi-track demos, not just like I'm recording myself on a guitar with the right, right, right. Yeah, multi-track demo. Like it'll sound like, um, you know, it'll sound like a real recording it, it, i don't think it sounds that good otherwise i would just put them out I, but it, it might be sloppy or something but it will have like multi-track guitars and all the different parts that i'll probably put in later um and i'll have an idea of what the whole thing's going to be i'll think well maybe this album's going to be you know 10 songs or something like that and i'll have 20 demos and then i'll be picking the best ones out but as i'm working i'm also thinking well you know if it's 10 songs i don't want it to drag on too long so i want to make sure the songs are tight so let's mm -hmm. go back through these demos and see you know can i make this this is four minutes can i make it three and a half or something like that and i'll try to get them to the point where they're kind of ready to be understood by other people before i send them out and say uh you know i think this song could use um a, a guitar solo by someone else, would you like to play it? Here's the song. And at that point, hopefully the demo is comprehensible and they can hear and go, yeah, I know what you're going for. Okay. And so they can record something and send it back if we're working that way. And would you just continue to work on the file that the original demo was on or do you start from scratch? Uh, I used to start from scratch, but now I just continue to work on that file okay. initially. Yeah, because that's what I was going to say. Yeah. I couldn't, I can't throw that stuff away. I'm always just like, sometimes there's a sound, at least in something or something that was captured during the original process that you just can't recreate. You well, know? like for instance, I'm working on a cover right now that I think will be out in May or uh, May or June. Um, and it's, it's just a song that a friend did um, a while ago, like a local band. So I started working up the demo just to like figure the song out because it's not something i could just look up you know tablature for or something it's a it's a friend's song mm -hmm. so i put that demo together it had really rough drums it had really badly played guitar by me it had me singing multiple people's parts on all that stuff and then as i've been working on it you know i had um like brian came in and played bass uh, so that replaced the old bass. I had Mike uh, played guitar. That replaced the guitar. Um, all the vocals need to be redone, etc. Basically, everything is replaced. But it's just easy for easiest for the process if I just keep going off that same session. And sometimes okay. I'll save a new session, like if I want to preserve the old one. So I might say, you know, this file name two or something right. like that. Or if I have a really drastic change I want to try, like, oh, let's completely change the bridge. I might save a new session, but I'm always kind of just evolving those original sessions. I keep building on the same session. I just keep working farther and farther down the track. So, like, mm. sometimes the actual song will be, like, maybe 15 minutes down the track, and that will be the session that we end up using as the final, but the original will still be over to the left. 
Yeah, we do that. Um, when I recorded, um, there's a, a Brian Church has a band called Viola Bajo, and they are a trio with drums, electric bass, and um, a viola and vocals. Mm -hmm. um, so I just recorded their second EP, which should be out sometime this year. And nice. the way we did that was we recorded guide tracks on um a full kit and then a uh he played bass along with the drummer direct okay so we get multiple takes of the song all in a row on the session um with a really kind of a bass we knew we were going to replace eventually and so often since the last one or the second to last one might have been best yeah all the the final versions of the song were 10 minutes into the into the session but um we kept all the old ones just to have them yeah no i my problem is is we'll have something we played or ideas that we laid down and then i'll be mm -hmm. like you know this part would work better i'm i usually do i'm going to rearrange it but i don't want to lose in case i screw up or do something stupid right. i don't want to lose the original and that's why but then it'll be like i oh, know i do like that and then i'll take the original guitar line and i'll start i'll go i'm going to chop out these two notes and then use that hold note that he did like five minutes later and i'll turn that into one riff right next like yeah basically mm -hmm. it's my way of being able to destroy the original tracks without destroying the tracks yeah when i get to that point if i think i'm going to destroy something i might just save and because i mean the session files are tiny compared to the actual uh wave files within them right so i might save another one if i think i'm gonna make a lot of changes but i do try to keep them cleaner than i used to because since i'm involving um collaborators who mm. might be remote so that i might never get to talk to in person about it and i'm just sending them stems i just want to make that easy on myself and say right. you know this like when you open this i want you to see exactly what's going on yeah in these stems what DAW are you using? I'm using Reaper. Okay. I see so many champions for Reaper, and it's one of the few da DAWs I've never actually worked with. Um, uh, it's it's really good. Um, it's the one I always recommend to new people because the, uh, aside from just being very fully featured, the demo is, at least it was when I was on the demo, but I think it still is, completely fully featured except you have the timer at the beginning so like mm. you have to wait five seconds um and then when you actually buy it it's very affordable i can't remember what it is but i think maybe fifty dollars or it's under a hundred dollars okay and you've been using time. this the whole time or did you finally move over to it or uh i've been using it um i probably a little over 10 years okay so i can't remember exactly what I, there was a period where i wasn't sure exactly what i was doing and i think i was messing around a lot with like um fruity loops and stuff like that where yeah. i was trying to but uh that's where i figured out how to do like midi within reaper i've just been basically using reaper for all that stuff just out of curiosity have you ever tried i'm forgetting the name of it now but there was a free and open source daw that was a waterfall version um, it's one no, where the tracks went down instead of sideways. No, I don't think oh, I've seen It was that. really fun. It was great to, so it had built in drums and stuff and they were all accessible through the laptop keyboard. And it was mm. like playing, actually it was kind of like playing Rockstar, the video game. It was because you would just kind of write something and you could also have mm -hmm. your other hand be the bass and you could literally freeform while the thing just went down and you could see the mm. MIDI notes charging there anyway i've i've only run into one other person that's used it before so that's why i was curious maybe you had been no, another I'm, person that had tried it i'm kind of lazy with trying out different um software because once i have something set up i don't really want to think about it anymore. oh absolutely yeah no this but, was back when i was trying things <laughs> now now i deviate very seldomly <laughs> mm -hmm. i need to get stuff done and speaking of that, like with all the stuff you're doing, what is your studio set up? Like what's your what's your home recording studio like? Um, well, at home, I record in a few different places, but um, at home, it's really nothing. It's like I have a um, 
microphone, I have uh, some guitars, and I have uh, an audio interface, you know, plus the computer. Um, and that's mostly what I use for, I mean, I have more than one microphone, but I, I usually just use one or two. Um, I don't have like a special space or anything at home. And if I need to record something louder or really loud vocals or something like that, I will go to um, an office space or something and after hours. And I'll basically bring the whole, I'll just bring my laptop, I'll bring the microphone and everything like in a backpack. So okay. really, I, I don't have like a great big dedicated space or anything because I'm doing almost always doing digital um, amp, like virtual amps, simulated okay. amps. Um, and stuff like that. So I don't, I don't have like a great um, recording space, but I don't really need one. I, I want to expand on the digital amps because that's going to be interesting. But first, let me go back to, so you sing in an office space. Tell me about this. How are you finding oh. office spaces? Oh, no, no, no. It's, it's, uh, I, for, uh, I do like, uh, graphic design work and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I'll, um, I don't usually go into an office, but sometimes I do. And I'll just like, after people have gone home. Okay. I'll, I'll set up because, you know, it's, um, there's more privacy and there's, uh, nobody there, you know, after right. hours, it's totally empty. So, cause if I'm at home, um, if you need to like scream or something, like yeah. I'm in the middle of Boston. There's going to be people upstairs, people next door. <laughs> uh, or if you're recording like drums or something like that, then you definitely need to find like a place to do that. So. Yeah. No, my my understanding of when you said that, and this is why I asked, is I thought maybe oh. you had an in with like, like a realtor. Oh. <laughs> and he's like, no, hey, I've got although, a place um, that's available right now. Although um, when Hexmap did our second album uh, it was about 10 years ago we okay. uh i think mike's work at the time was changing offices and they had like an an incomplete unfinished open plan office space where we recorded i think all the drums or maybe like half or two-thirds of the drums for that album just setting up in this unfinished like diehard looking office space nice okay that's surprising to me that you don't have a dedicated space but i guess maybe not i don't, I don't know it's well i, I guess mean, for I, the amount of people you work with i would assume that you have a dedicated space well i mean we do so much stuff direct that i mean we, i have a uh like we're, the room i'm in now like uh like kind of an office room and i can easily set up a audio interface in here and plug in a bass or a guitar or something and we can play it and record it it's just not like guitars on the wall and you know anything like that okay i could i could set it up just as easily anywhere yeah and sometimes i will like i'll go to somebody else's place if they need to and, and record yeah it's a little tricky like with that project where we had the viola you know that you kind of need to be careful with how you're like we had to record that in somebody's in brian's living room and you don't want like any little sound like you know turn up make sure the air conditioner is off you know, if some bird is tweeting outside that might that might ruin the take yeah you can't plug that yeah. direct <laughs> and it's yeah it's tough when i do like acoustic guitar you know stuff can get in the mix but for the for the electric or for anything that i'm doing digital or simulated amps or something you can do that anywhere yeah and tell me about your simulated amp. I, I guess um, I want to say gear, but I guess it would be assembly. The, the stuff you're using, like to get the sound that you like to use. I'm assuming you're mixing stuff up. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, I still have amps, and I still have a lot of hardware. Yeah. Uh, I just don't. I don't hardly ever use it anymore. Um, my effects chain for guitars now is. Um, it's usually a mix of things. I'll run it through like a, an actual, um, uh, a, like amp sim, like, um, uh, one of them, I think S gear I use a lot. 
Hmm. There's one called uh, Cypress that I use sometimes. Um, and that'll sound pretty good. But then I usually run that through a few more things to like um, either degrade it more or, you know, more reverby if that's what I want. What I've been going for lately a lot of times is I'll maybe I'll put it from through like the amp sim, but then I'll put it through like a like a cassette degradation sim or something just to get it sounding like nastier. Right. Especially if it's like a distorted guitar in a rock mix. Um, that can hold up to being really distorted because um, you're not hearing it isolated. Mm -hmm. So to give room to bass and to give room to the drums and everything, but still have the guitar sound, um, I don't want to say big, but to sound like a parent, um, I'll put more distortion on it sometimes than you would think. Um, yeah. To get the, like to get that like high end like not um, like in real life if I'm going through an amp I'll usually just do overdrive. Uh, if I'm recording it I won't use like a distortion pedal. I'll just overdrive it so I can make sure to still get those uh, you know the definition. Mm -hmm. But with the amp sim, um, you uh, uh, there's a lot more tweaking you can do to make sure you keep the definition you want. And I found that um the part of like the frequency range that a distorted guitar can take can sometimes be really distorted but it's not taking up too much of the spectrum okay so you know you might have like this chunk where the bass lives and the drums are all over the place and you have the vocals and then um the guitar might sound really bad if you had it soloed mm -hmm. but in the mix it can work as right blue. yeah <laughs> <laughs> sorry i know how that goes it's like it sounds fine in the mix but then you solo it and it's like what's that why is, yeah no it, it, <laughs> there's definitely yeah. that sometimes and yeah i try not to worry too much about what things sound like solo because it doesn't really matter i yeah i rarely solo things but it is a surprise sometimes when you want to see how it's cutting through the mix or if it's supposed mm -hmm. to be louder or if something else is but most of the time, all the mixing I do is with everything else. Otherwise, exactly. You can have the opposite effect where you spend all this time making it sound great and then you play it with everything else and it sounds like either like garbage or it's too quiet or doesn't fit right. it anymore. Yeah. It'll be muddy. If everything sounds big by itself, when you put them together, they'll sound muddy. Right. And I actually would like to talk to you about a project that you have coming up because I'm kind of going through a similar thing and I'd like to pick your brain. You have a remix that you sent me before we started this interview that's going to be coming out in March, which will probably be mm -hmm. shortly before this is actually released. So it'll yeah. already be out. Uh, it'll have been out March 27th. Yeah. It, first of all, tell me about this remix. Uh, well, we got a, um, uh, where should I start? Last, a couple of years ago, I did an album, um, I think it was in 2020. And one thing I always wanted to try was doing a, um, like Nine Inch Nails would do a remix album after every album they put out. Yeah, do like, like a, a mega album remix album. album. <laughs> yeah, it would be like, it wasn't like um, how like The Cure did an album of remixes of like their greatest hits or something. The right. Nine Inch Nails ones were always a remix album of that previous album. So they Well, have, I even had one that went further, which the, uh, like the first Pretty Hate Machine album he did one for each song in the album and it was every iteration of that song. Like I had a head, like a whole right. CD that had 20 different versions of head, like a whole on it. Yeah. Or yeah, you do it with singles too. So there'd be like a single with all these different versions. So yeah. I wanted to try that. So I did one, I think in 2021, um, I had a few people do guest remixes on it and I did a bunch of remixes. We put that out. That was fun, but it took a lot of time. Mm-hmm because I did so much of it that I could have been doing new music. And then in 2022, I did, um, my album came out around that Halloween. Um, that was All Night Midnight Monster Party. And that did really well for me. So I thought, well, I'd like to do some remixes, but I'm not going to, I think that was 13 tracks. I'm like, I'm not going to organize 13 different remixes for this. That's, that's too much. So we did an EP that had four remixes. I did two, and then two other people did some. 
um, and we put some instrumentals on there, and that was fun. People liked it, and I thought, okay, well, I'd like to do something like that again, but that the first one I did felt like a, too much, and that felt like not quite enough. So mm. this last album I did was called Creepy Zippy, and it was seven songs, and I thought, well, we'll probably do one for each of these. So I got um, five people to do remixes of their own for five of the songs. I'm doing two of them. Um, and that will hopefully be out. Uh, the remix album will hopefully be out about the end of April. But we're doing the first single as a remix of Sweet Little Wish that I did. Okay. That should have just come out when this when this podcast is out. And um, yeah, it's like it feels like it's just about the right amount of of effort for what this is. <laughs> it's it is a full remix of the whole thing. There's going to be a remix of every song, but it's a short album, so you're taking seven songs and then the remix album will be those seven songs remixed by different people in different styles. There's like one that's um that sounds like heavy metal. Mm -hmm. There's um at least one or two that are using like all like hardware um to remix like not doing it in a in a daw but using like different kinds of electronic hardware oh like um, what yeah um i don't i don't really know the the names of things because that's not my domain oh that's but, not yours okay but i no uh like uh mike gintz who's in hexmap with me is doing one um i think he's using a few different synthesizers like he's using a, a sampler and uh and a synthesizer hmm. and then another mic uh mike weekly who uh goes by killer b relay team did a is doing a remix of creepies that's one of the songs on the album mm -hmm. that he actually live streamed the process um he has a twitch channel nice and he he cut up samples of the vocals and he was running them through like sampler hardware um, and then like generating beats and all that stuff and then kind of recorded the best takes. What was, what's his Twitch channel? Do you know off the top of your head? I don't remember the, it's probably just killer B relay team, but if okay. you, if you uh, Google that, I'm sure you'll find it. But yeah. I nice. Think, oh, yeah, I want to check that out. That's cool. Um, yeah, he live streams um, all sorts of like, uh, like he'll just go for an hour or something doing yeah. live synthesis. Nice. And so I was curious if the remix that I had heard, the Sweet Little Witch one, uh, was one that you did. So here was what I wanted to ask you about. Mm -hmm. um, the remix process. So we also are currently going through, for Net Label Day, we're doing a uh, remix collaboration, looking for other artists to put something out on Block Sonic for uh, Net Label Day in mm -hmm. July 14th, I think it is. So had people come in and of course I'm amazed I'm people are sending stuff and I'm like, wow, what they did with the song. Like it's, I, you never think that like, I'm going, Oh, that'll be kind of cool. People send it. And I'm like, Jesus, this is like, so just out there what they're doing. And it's great. And I'm mm -hmm. like, well, I should try I, I need to learn how to remix. Let me do it. Well, I explained before how I like to chop up things already in the music we did. Mm -hmm. And I did stuff and I tried to do one that was kind of themed. And by the time I was done, I just felt like I rewrote one of our songs. You know, yeah. it's, it's, it just sounds like me making one of our songs, like, cause this is already the process I do. So how do you overcome, <laughs> come not just going, well, I'm just replaying this song. Um, well, if I'm remixing my own stuff, I try to go into it with a, um, with a reason for like what I'm doing, like, uh, at least a, a vision of why this will be different. Um, for this particular remix, I think the song has been out since September, since last September. And I was seeing who was enjoying it, you know, online, like what kind of people were listening to it. And I was thinking, well, um, I'd like to try to make a version of this song that those people could maybe like play in their car, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> play mm -hmm. louder or like to like have something more upbeat. Um, and also at the same time, the background vocals on the first version I thought were really good, but they were 
definitely background vocals. And I thought, well, I could take those and I could, I, it's by a woman named uh, Mickey Lee Smith. And I thought I could take those vocals and turn them up, make them, give them more spotlight and I could have it be, you know, um, the featuring Mickey Lee Smith and give her more of a boost there. Mm -hmm. So those two things, I wanted like a more upbeat kind of dancey version and I wanted one that showcased her more. And I took the original track, changed the beat, turned her up. And then once I did that, I could start noticing everything else that had to change. Like um, maybe this original guitar was no longer the original. The original version of the song was kind of like loose. And so all of the parts didn't really fit anymore. So mm -hmm. I'd have like a guitar that was kind of. Uh, I'll say loose, not sloppy. I, I played it, but you know, I just be like, well, I have to get rid of that. I'll yeah. play something new. Uh, and you know, maybe since that guitar is gone, I'll add some more synth here, and that'll tighten it up. And then this part has to change, and this part has to change, and then then the whole thing kind of changes based on that. Um, but I always try to go in with some idea of at least one or two things that I want to majorly change mm -hmm. and then see what happens. Okay. And what about the overall instrumentation? Are you using a lot of the original instruments or are you pretty much just doing straight up vocal track and then write, writing um, new stuff? Depends on the song. On this track, I did cut out a lot of the original instrumentation because it wasn't tight enough for the dance beat because the original version of the song um like i said was kind of like loose it was kind of like a little acoustic groovy, okay. multiple layers of kind of loose acoustic tracks and the like the bass didn't work anymore um mm. you know it's not brian's fault it just wasn't like because it wasn't played to this to uh this beat oh yeah yeah no it was the just, slight difference can ruin it, it yeah was slightly off uh, <laughs> so i took a synth and i i recreated his bass part but it's just i had to make it work with this beat i used a little bit of the original guitar but i cut a lot of it out i recorded some new guitar everything just had to be a little bit tighter so on this particular track i i didn't keep much we did have a uh, violin part on it mm -hmm. that i reversed because mm. i liked it but i thought well something should change about it so i just completely reversed it uh and it worked it came in like a new part um but i didn't keep much of the uh, um on this one other okay than the vocals not because i didn't want to i mean i would have loved to not have to redo anything right it just I kept noticing things that weren't working with the new beat. So that led to me making up new parts. Okay. And do you sell, I, I just thought of this. Do you sell physical copies of your albums? Yeah. Um, we sell um, for like big releases. Like if I'm doing an album, for the last few I've done CD and cassette um, for stuff like um, singles or if I'm putting out like one cover or something like that, I won't do a physical one right away. Although once I've banked enough of them, I might do a, a physical collection or something like that. Okay. Where do you get those done at? Where do you get them printed? Um, I've done a few different places. I'll usually just do disc makers for the, for the CDs. Okay. Um, and for the cassettes lately, I've been doing a duplication dot ca it's a canadian uh oh. place i have done a few different cassette places and the reason why i like them a lot is i like the quality of the uh paper inserts that they use really yeah uh because i've done other places that the cassettes turn out great and everything looks great but i feel like the cassette the um insert quality is just not quite up to um what you would expect from like yeah. a There's, professional you, product. You just made me think of a really weird random thing that's kind of related. I remember when I want to say SST records must have switched cassette makers because there was mm -hmm. a time period and it was around the time the descendants turned into the band all and all of the cassettes during that time, whether it be crumb suckers or 
uh, all these different types of bands during that time. Cassettes were fine. They had cool prints directly on the cassettes. Some of them were colored, but the inserts all smelled like tortillas. <laughs> <laughs> like every I single. That. <laughs> but it was just, I remember that being the weirdest thing. And I'm just thinking, like, what? What the hell happened to these? Why do they smell like I I I want to have Taco Bell all of a sudden? <laughs> um, it was really funny. Anyway, so going <laughs> going back to the Canadian cassette makers, yeah. So and you find them kind of reasonable. Is there a limit to how many you can do? Uh, like a minimum or a, yeah, a maximum. Minimum. Sorry. Uh, I I actually don't know. I I probably not. You probably just have to pay a full crap load if you just wanted to make one i like they um, <laughs> i suppose that's they true. do have to set, they do have to set up um you know for the job um no i found their prices to be um competitive um and the and the quality is really good okay as far as i can tell i mean i haven't the problem is you can't like make the same job at two different places and then compare you know, be yeah, good. yeah, yeah, be ridiculous. That's true. And then compare audio quality or whatever, and uh, they give you a lot of options for the kind of tape and the kind of the process. Like if you wanted to uh, real time or um, double, I don't know. If people listening would know what this means, but like when they duplicate this, the tapes, if they do it in real time or they do it twice, I think it's twice speed. Mm -hmm. And the quality will be slightly better if it's real time, but it costs more because it's going to take them twice as long. Which is um, funny because recording at a faster space at a faster pace is better quality if you record it two times. Or right. At least that's what I've well, been told. Yeah, I think it's the it's just the uh, yeah, like if you imagine when they're copying the tapes over both going twice as fast. I think it's just there might it might be a slightly lower quality. But it's hard to compare because right. you're not going to get the whole job done multiple times in different ways and, and see how they sound. Yeah. And I don't know how many people who are buying the tapes are listening to the tapes or if they just want, you know, a keepsake or if they are listening, if they want it to sound, you know, more like it's on tape. Yeah. They might not want it to sound, <laughs> sound the best. But And you're just yeah, selling they're, these they're on good. Bandcamp, right? You don't have a website that you're putting them on or anything? Um, yeah, I, I have a website, but I sell them through Bandcamp right now. Okay. Um, and I sell them in, um, uh, I have a store in, well, I don't have the store, but there's a store in Mexico City that sells them um, in that market because I have some fans in Mexico who want to buy the stuff, but it it costs way too much to ship it um, one at a time to everybody. Yeah. You, know, you don't want to buy a $10 tape and then have to spend twenty dollars to ship it so right those are kind of the the two ways to get them either through my website or if you're if someone's in mexico they should order it through this other store but okay otherwise it's just those two places i don't usually make too many copies of these things they're kind of just for like either like super fans or my friends who want to buy them yeah no it's one of those things that I always entertain the idea, but I'm like, can I really justify it? Like, would I even buy one if I had to? <laughs> well, I mean, the when I do it, you know, I try to be serious about the math and I make, um, generally I make the money back from the manufacturing and all that. I don't try to make the, um, uh, I don't expect the CD and cassette sales to like make up for every, um, every expense. Like, the mastering or if I have to pay some a musician to play a part or something, any yeah. of those things that I would do anyway, I don't expect it to make it back, but I can make the money back for the actual manufacturing. So like if it's a question of, do I make tapes or not? That's usually for me, at least thankfully not a, not a big gamble Okay, because you know, I can, I can make back the money for making a small rent of tapes. Um, and it's fun to have them. Yeah, but um, you know, it's and it's not a huge expense. Like it, the most annoying thing with anything like this is if you have a bunch of stuff like sitting in your basement forever or something like that. Especially if you're ordering like T-shirts or something, where you really don't want to have, you know, a hundred T-shirts mm -hmm. in your basement, even if you did make your money back. Right. 
Yeah, I agree. Then with uh, summer coming up, do you have any shows planned out already? Do you are you ex- uh, planning to do some things this uh, summer out in the world? I don't have any shows planned out. I have um, I have like a basic release schedule planned for when stuff is going to come out this summer. Uh, I don't have like a uh, band right now. I mean, I have a okay a band, but I don't have a band. If you know what I mean, like I don't right. have a band that can go play a show. You don't have uh, a we can all stand together and do this in front of people right. band. Yeah, right. Uh, and like I said, with that like the store in mexico city i have the most fans probably there and if i was going to be playing a show there i would have to probably find local people to play which i would love to do but i don't have any plans at the moment to do that just because like uh, uh, it seems much more realistic than convincing you know five or six people to practice here and then we all fly down all right <laughs> and then play a show and then come back um so i would love to do that but at the moment i don't have any any plans okay and so what is your release schedule like this summer uh, or well, this year trying, i should say you probably got stuff what i've been trying there. to do is have something coming out every month or so um i didn't have anything in january but so I had a telephone came out in February. I have this new remix coming out or just came out in mm-hmm. March. Um, the rest of the remix album should be in April. There should be another song in May and hopefully a new album. I'm hoping like September, nice. in which case I would put out some singles before that. So there should be a like a song, at least a song every month or so. I'm sure I'll miss a few months. And then once you get to the end of the year, uh, nobody's really listening to new stuff in December. So yeah, no, we did a release in December and it was much lower than the other ones that we did. (laughs) I've done it. I've done it before. It's just tricky. Yeah. I've done Christmas music before. Uh, and even that you have to get out well before December. Um, it's just kind of a really tough zone. Yeah. Yeah. This, (laughs) Yeah, we did a Christmas song once, and I remember we thought it was the smartest thing, and then every year it comes around, and it's like, I don't want to do it again. <laughs> I don't feel like it. <laughs> I did a Christmas album in 2018, um, and it did pretty well for me, at least at the time, for uh, you know, compared to how things had been at, at that time. Um, I think that came out in November. Okay. Uh, and I had wished I had put it out a little bit early. And then a few times since then, like this past year, I did one. It was a New Year's song, but it was a holiday song. And I put that out in late November. And ideally, if someone else was doing this and I was giving them advice, I'd say, even if you have a Christmas song, put it out like maybe, maybe the very beginning of November, right after Halloween or yeah. something like that, just because you need... You want like a lot of runway for that song to get played uh, while it's still the holiday season. Because once Christmas is passed, nobody's going to be listening to that anymore. So right, maybe they will a year a year later, but they won't that year. No, even the um, stores are changing halfway through Halloween to their Christmas displays. I've noticed the past few years. Yeah, if I was going to put out anything in like December, I would do like oh, it's an acoustic version of an older song or something oh, like that. Yeah. that Maybe like fans would like, but isn't going to be like a huge promotional deal for you where you're fighting people who aren't paying any attention to music right. at all for a month. Okay. And if people wanted to check out your stuff, where would you suggest they go to do that? Well, I have nicholasburgess.com um, that exists and... But really, all the links should be on there. I, you know, I have an Instagram page, I have a Facebook page, and YouTube, and all of that stuff. And I, I'm trying to keep up to date with those as much as I can. Yeah, uh, it's difficult, but um, yeah, you know, I should update. Everybody needs to update their websites, but I should update it again. I should update all those links. Okay. Um, and yeah, if you don't know 
how to spell my name. It would be N I C H O L A S B U R G E S S. I do always have to rethink your last name every time I spell it. <laughs> yeah, it would be better if I had like a, I should make like an easier to remember uh, URL like that goes there too. Yeah. I have what a would bunch you of do? URLs, I don't think. I don't know. I've done it in, in a, for previous albums. I've gotten like shorter URLs um, that aim like at that specific album. Mm-hmm. I don't know what I would do, but do some uh, just some like random combination of words might be easier to say on like a podcast. Yeah. Now I'm trying to think of a good one, but all I can think are funny ones. <laughs> <laughs> like my first album was uh, a solo album was Wizard Planet, and I had. I don't think it was .com. I think I had like wizardplanet.us or something like that. that okay. Yeah, I could see that been, one being taken. <laughs> yeah, it may have just like redirected back to my band camp or something like that. Right. That on the topic of the website name, the if you want something easy to Google, the thing that people find me on like YouTube when I look at like the search results is the name of the last album, Creepy Zeepy. Hmm. That might be easier for people to spell. <laughs> so it's just the word creepy and then Z-E-E-P-Y. Z -E -E -P -Y. Uh, yeah, that's how people find it. Interesting. That's that's what YouTube shows you. Huh. Uh, yeah, and on the, like my most popular songs on YouTube, when I look in the when I look in like the search um, results that people find it by, that's usually like one of the higher than my name usually. Okay. Well, all right. We'll go there then, right. people. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks so much for talking with me today. Thank you. Pew, pew.